We started this Jonah series talking about the stages that Jonah went through in his emotions. When he was running from God, and he, was, he wasn't just running from what God told him to do. He was actually literally running from the very presence of God. And in running from God, we see a couple things that happen. You know, all we ever want to talk about is the fact that a giant fish, a whale, swallowed Jonah. But there's so much more to this story than a giant whale swallowing Jonah. Although, let's be honest, that's kind of cool. There's so much more to the story. And what we see in this story is this man who, who's running from God, who's running from the call of God. And he finds himself going through these four stages of emotions because he's literally running from God. And I think many of us last Sunday could admit that, boy, we sure can relate to some of those things. And then chapter 1 ends with this giant fish swims up. The, the Bible says God appointed a giant fish to go swallow Jonah. So this fish swallows Jonah, which again is very cool. Swallows him and for three days he's in the belly of the well. And we talked about the fact that sometimes when we're going through things that God has got to get us alone. See, when Jonah was in the belly of the well, he was by himself, right? Nobody else was hanging. I mean, he wasn't having a tea party in there. They weren't playing Yahtzee. He was by himself in the belly of the well for three days. God had to get him alone. But something unique happened during those three days. Something very unique happened. He did what many of us would hopefully do. He prayed. Now, how many of you know, if you're stuck in the belly of a well, you're going to pray? You know, they say, they say uh, prayer's been taken out of school. Let me be very clear. As long as they have tests in school, there will be prayer in school. You will, hear, you will see atheists. God, if you exist, help me get an A. People pray when they're under pressure. And let's be honest, in the belly of a well, there's a little bit of pressure. And what I want us to do today is I want us to look at the prayer that Jonah prayed when he was in the belly of the well. Because I think there's some things there that we've missed. Some things that we've passed by. Some things that really apply to us. If you have your Bibles, open up to Jonah chapter 2. If you don't, feel free to grab one of those Bibles in the pew back behind you. Or there's uh, verses on the screen. Jonah chapter 2. Starting in verse 1. It says, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of a fish. Let's all agree that's a good thing to do, right? Saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Verse 4. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall, look, shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. At the roots of the mountains I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. You, yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. Verse 7. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And then verse 10. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. There's nothing like praying a good prayer, and the next thing you know, you get vomited out of something. Anybody ever been there? No. Thank goodness. You know, we look at verse two, chapter 2, and, and, and I see something. See, you can learn a lot about somebody by the way they pray. You can. You can learn a lot about their mentality, where they're at in life. There's a story about a, a little girl who was being punished, and she had to eat alone in the corner of the dining room, and the family paid no attention to her until they heard her pray, I thank thee, Lord, for preparing a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I like that little girl. You can tell a lot about people by the way they pray. Help me to relax about insignificant details, O oh God, beginning tomorrow at 7.41 and 23 seconds a.m. Eastern Time. Help me to consider people's feelings, even if most of them are hypersensitive. Yeah. Help me to take responsibility for the consequences of my actions, even though they're usually not my fault. You can really tell a lot about somebody by their prayers. Help me to be more laid back and help me do exactly what's right. Help me to take things more seriously, especially laughter, parties, and dancing. Give me patience, and I mean right now. Like, like right now, God, give me patience. Not tomorrow, God, I need patience now. Help me not be a perfectionist. Did I spell that correctly? Help me to finish everything I say. Help me to keep my mind on one thing. Oh, oh look, a bird. 
Come on, how many of you have been there? Help me to do what I can and trust you for the rest. And would you mind putting that in writing? Keep me open to others' ideas, misguided though they may be. Help me follow established procedures. Hey, wait, wait a minute, God, this, this, is, this is wrong. You're doing this wrong. Help me to slow down and trust the rest of trust you with everything that I do, oh God. Thank you, Lord, amen. You know, you can tell a lot about somebody by the way they pray. You listen to people's prayers, and, and listen, I, before I became a pastor, and unfortunately when you're a pastor, let me just tell you what happens. Everybody expects you to pray over everything. I went over to the singles house. We were standing around in this beautiful kitchen, Diane, there's food everywhere. And I'm like, hey, let's eat. What, what's the holdup? And I'm looking around, they're all looking at me. I go, what, I got to pray because I'm the pastor? The pastor's got to do all the praying? Yeah, okay. You know, back before I was a minister, I, I loved when I'd be able to hear other people pray because nobody ever asked me to pray. Have I ever told you the story about the first time I prayed at the family event? It was a Thanksgiving. And I just came out of Bible school and I was sitting around the Thanksgiving table. And my granddad always says the prayer because that's what my granddad does. That's the tradition in our family. And we're all standing there holding hands and my granddad looks at me and he goes, Well, Jeremy, you're a minister now. Why don't you pray over the meal? Me? Yeah, you. Okay. Everybody take hands. Let's pray. Hail Mary, full of grace. Watch us as we stuff our face. Amen. I got one of them looks that only a granddaddy can give. You know one of them looks like, I will kill you, tell God you died, and we'll never speak of your name again? I got one of them looks. And I repented, and then I prayed right. And then he never let me pray again. <laughs> I love listening to the way people pray because we all pray differently. You have those people that kind of try to force it. You know, they, they talk normal to everybody else, but then they pray. And it's, oh, thou beseecheth you, O Lord, Father, beloved, Savior, God, and then you hear people praying and they'll, they'll, they'll just pray about things and mumble and they really are, God, and I need you a bird. Oh, and I need a car and I'm hungry, God. Let's eat. And you tell a lot about somebody by the way they pray. And I think about this story in Jonah and I think about the fact that if you really look at his prayer, you can see into the heart of a man. Because the prayers are a window to our soul, if you will. Our prayers, the way we communicate to the God we serve are are a window to who we truly are. We can see beyond the flesh and the, the rhetoric, the religious junk that we put on, and we can see the reality of who we truly are. In Jonah chapter 2, verse 1, I, wanna, I want us to break apart this prayer a little bit. Y'all with me? All right, we're going to learn a little bit about Scripture, but we're going to see how Jonah can re relate to all of us. In Jonah chapter 2, verses 1, it says, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me out of the belly of Sheol, I cried, and you heard my voice. What we see there is Jonah is crying out to God in one of the most unlikely places. See, Jonah made his house of hell become a house of prayer. Jonah took a moment that was the most unlikely place to pray, a moment where the world seemed like it was closing in. Come on, we've all been in bad situations, haven't we? We've all been in that situation where we go, well, when it rains, it pours. Come on, you know what I'm talking about, where one thing happens and the next thing you know, it feels like a domino effect and everything's falling down around you. And that can be pretty bad. But is it as bad as ending up in the belly of a well? I mean, I've had some bad days. I've had, I, I've had a rough week this week. It seems like everything that could go wrong has gone wrong. But it still doesn't amount to being in the belly of a well. Even though we may not have ever been in the actual literal belly of a well, I think that we can all relate to that house of hell. And I'm not cussing for all of you that go, can you say that in church? I can't. I'm talking about those moments where our world is falling apart, where we feel like we can't go any further, when we feel like everything around us is crumbling. You've either been in that situation, you are in that situation, or you will be in that situation at some point because those moments happen in our lives where everything falls apart. But when everything falls apart, what God's looking for is, will you take your house of hell and turn it into a house of prayer? Regardless of what you're going through, because God is there. You know, so many times we... We create this mentality of the perfect place to pray. Well, it's during the daytime hours at the church, preferably Sundays between 9 and 10. That's my time to pray, Pastor. That's right now, if you didn't catch that. I don't pray during the week. I wait till I get to church. It's easier then. Maybe, maybe your prayer time is in your car. Maybe your prayer time is in a moment of distress when you're about to take a test. See, the perfect time and place to pray may not be at church, and it may not be at the time that you've allotted. The perfect place and time to pray is right now. 
See, we're a people that try to depend on ourselves, don't we? We're a people that try to make things happen on our own. But what God's looking for is for us to get down and pray. See, many times we shut down instead of shouting out to God. Now, that's not in your notes, but that'd be something good to write down. Many times we shut down instead of shouting out to God. How many men do I have in the house? How many of you men are the fix-it kind of guys where you, you can fix it? Just whatever it is, I'm going to fix it. Especially if it's a female. My wife's going through something, I'm going to fix her. I'm learning, y'all. Help me out here. My kids are going through something, I'm going to fix it. I'm not talking about just with tools. I'm talking about situations where we go, you know what? I'm going to fix the situation. Many times when we can't fix it, we shut down, though. Many times when we can't change our circumstance, we shut down. And what God's looking for us is not to shut down. It's to cry out to him. It's to shout out to him. When you look at this story, I don't know about you, but if I was swallowed up by a well, I'm probably going to go through the process of shutting down. I'm probably going to get angrier, more bitter, maybe even more violent. Something's going to happen. I'm not just going to sit there. My life's caving in. But instead, what Jonah does is he stops and he prays. The next thing we see Jonah do is in Jonah chapter 2, verse 3. It says, For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. You know, when we read that, we, we think that he's like declaring something. But let me, let, me, let me throw your theology for a loop here. What's happening is he is hearing God outside of the ordinary. And it surprises him. When Jonah says those words, he's saying them with the mentality of, Oh my goodness, you cast me into the deep. Into the hearts of the seas and the flood surrounded around me and all your billows passed over me. For you cast me here. And, and oh my goodness, I, I feel your presence. I'm not alone. See, God was speaking to him in the belly of a well. He heard God outside of the ordinary. The funny thing is, and the reason why I'm telling you that, is because Jonah was a prophet of the Lord. And he was trained to believe that only the prophet could hear the Lord in Jerusalem. He was trained to believe that as a prophet, God resided in his little box. Anybody ever been there? Where you put God in a box. Come on now. You put God in a box and say, oh no, this is how God works. But what God was saying is, look, I'm going to put you in a place that is outside of your comfort zone. How many of you know the belly of a well is a little bit outside our comfort zone? And I'm going to speak to you and show you that I am the same God in Jerusalem as I am in the belly of a fish. I am the same God on the mountaintop as I am in the valley. I am where you're at right now. See, sometimes God has to change our position in order to change our perspective. Now I want to linger here for a minute. That's, that's good. Sometimes God will change our position. In order to change our perspective. It's one of your feelings. Write that down. See the reason is. Is so many times. In life we. We get God and we put him in this box. And we have a way of viewing God. We have a way of knowing who God is. We have a way of locking God into this, this system, if you will. This protocol of this is how God does things. This is how God moves. This is who God is. But sometimes what God's looking for in our situations is a change of perspective by a change in our position. See, if Jonah had never left Jerusalem, he never would have learned this. He never would have learned that God is omnipotent. He never would have learned that God was everywhere at all times, that he's omniscient, that he's omnipresent. He never would have learned those things, that he was all-knowing everywhere. He was all things. He never would have learned that if he hadn't been in the belly of a well. Let me, let me explain this to you in another way. You may be here today and go, Pastor, I feel like I've been living in my personal house of hell. My home life, my, my work life, my school life, my marriage, my family. Sometimes God will put you in a position to change your perspective. And sometimes we need a different position to change our perspective. Now, that's how good God is. And it's not always easy because we look at the circumstance we're in and we go, God, this isn't fair. This isn't what I was hoping for. This isn't what I was looking for. But God is saying, I need you in a different position in order to change your perspective so you can see me for who I am and take me out of that box. I tell people all the time, I'm probably one of the few pastors dumb enough to tell his congregation, go to somebody else's church. What do I have to lose? Go to somebody else's church. 
Check out other churches in your community. If you're on vacation, it's the only time I ever get to go go to other churches if I'm traveling on vacation. And I love going to someone else's church. You know what happens? I have a change of position, which changes my perspective. Sometimes we get so locked in of how service is done or how the pastor preaches. Listen, you may like the way I talk now, but I've only been here six months. Give it six years. Things sometimes need to be shaken up a little bit. Things sometimes need to be changed a little bit. We sometimes need to change our position to see that God doesn't necessarily fit in the little box that we put him in. God will speak and do things in places that we don't ordinarily expect him to. Sometimes we need to change our position. Jonah chapter 2 verses 4 through 6 it says, Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall look again upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me, To take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. Now, that's a really pretty way of saying my ears hurt and I've got stuff floating around my head. You all with me? That's that's a real fancy way of saying, hey God, in the belly of this well, we went really deep in my ears. How many of you can't, it hurts your ears when you go swimming deep? My, I've ruptured my eardrum like somewhere around four or five times. Okay, I know, that's crazy, right? I've ruptured my eardrum so many times that I was, I was, I was legally deaf at one point and God healed me. I've ruptured these ears, and, but I have all this scar tissue. And if I go swimming, I went swimming over at uh, the Busby's house the other day, and I jumped in their pool and I swam to the bottom, and it was like eight feet, and my ears were, felt like they were going to explode. Anybody ever felt that? No, I'm the only one? Y'all just look at me like I look dumb today. Hey, you may not be jiving with this message yet, but just hold on. It applies. If you've ever been somewhere where the pressure is just, oh, it hurts my ears. That's what he's talking about. Because whales don't swim on the surface. They go deep. And he's talking about things wrapped around his head. Let me tell you what else is in the belly of the whale. Nastiness. And a lot of it. What he is describing in this eloquent verse of Scripture is not some beautiful symbolic of something else. He's telling you the way it is. My ears hurt, it's dark, it stinks, and I got stuff floating around my head. He's complaining. How many of you, when we pray, you do that sometimes? All of us. (laughs) All of us. Oh, God, you're such a good God. But while I've got your attention, let me tell you about my job. Uh, Oh, my husband. And oh, my wife. My kids. And oh, that pastor, he this and that. And oh, those people I work with. And we complain. You can tell a lot about somebody by listening to their prayers. If you look at Jonah's prayer, he's complaining. What is he complaining about? Well, we can see something into his life that we need to look at. He had to reach the bottom of the bottom. He had to get to the lowest place he could. Maybe you've heard the old saying, some people have to hit rock bottom before they can look up. That saying is actually derived from this verse of Scripture. That mentality that you've got to hit the lowest point of your life. See, there's people out there that are like me, that they're stubborn, hard-headed, know-it-alls, like me. And it takes a while to learn a lesson. See, see, it wasn't always in my life that I could look at an, somebody that had been through it and learn their, from what they've gone through. For me, it was, hey, that's good, but I'm going to figure this out on my own. Getting lower and lower and lower. I can beat this addiction on my own. No, got lower and lower and lower. I can win this battle on my own. Nope, got lower, lower and lower. I can beat these mind games on my own. Nope, got lower, lower and lower. And some people, unfortunately, because we're hard-headed, we're stubborn, we're know-it-alls, we've got to hit the bottom of the bottom before we can ever look up. And Jonah was no different. Jonah's running from the very presence of God. He finds himself in the belly of a well, and he's crying out to God. And in his prayers, we learn something about the man, that he's no different than us, that he's had to hit rock bottom so that he can see up. I'm going to mess with your theology this morning with this next statement. See, God doesn't always use situations. He creates them. I know that's going to be hard for some of you to swallow this morning. But God doesn't always just use the current situation you're in. God doesn't always use that job circumstance or that financial circumstance. God doesn't just use what's been made available. Many times God will create those moments. Because he's needing us to learn something. He's needing us to grow. He's needing us to go to the next level of brokenness in order to be rebuilt. 
And that's not always easy to accept because how many of you know, sometimes it's uncomfortable. Sometimes life's not fair. Sometimes life hurts. Sometimes it feels like everything's coming against us. If you've not been there, well, you're a liar. You've all been there. Some of you are there today. We've all been there where we feel like the world's caving in around us. And we wonder, God, are you just capitalizing on all the stuff that's going wrong? God, are you just capitalizing on the fact that the housing market crashed? Let me tell you a personal story. I almost wonder if the housing market crashed just so I could learn something from God. Now, if you lost a, how many of you lost money on a home when all that mess went down? A lot of you? I, okay, you don't want to I know. You've talked to me. When the housing market crashed, we lost a home in, in uh, Alabama. And it's not something I like to talk about because if I don't tell the whole story, then people fill in the blanks and think I was just not paying my bills, and it's not the truth. I was done wrong by a bank, and, and I almost wonder sometimes, God, did you use the housing market to, to just to teach me something? Or did you, did you create the housing market crash just to teach me something? I'm not sure which it is, but I do know this. That I learned something about the nature of God that I needed losing $50,000 to teach me. I learned that God is my provider. That I can't provide them all. I can't create the perfect home for my family. I can't create the perfect life. Only God can create the perfect home and perfect life for my family. See, God will use, if not use, He will create circumstances to break you. Man, that's just fun and exciting. Let's, talk, let's go back to God blesses and God's favor. and whew, that's, that's good stuff, ain't it? Let's talk about all the stuff that Jesus does and He loves us. All that's true. But I need you to get this hard piece too. That God will use and create circumstances to break you also. And it may not seem fair and it's not fair. But God never said he was a fair God. God said he was a just God. God's got a reason for what he's doing. And he's doing it so we can develop our hearts. So that he can get us along. The Bible story is so beautiful how it says that God appointed a great fish. God, it's like he picked it up and grew it extra large, or I don't know what he did, but he put it in the right place at the right time. God orchestrated every part of this story for Jonah to learn a lesson. What circumstances are happening in your life right now that God has orchestrated for you to learn something, but you're sitting in the moment in the belly of your hell, crying out to God, saying it's not fair, instead of listening and learning to what he's using and creating around you? Jonah chapter 2 verse 7 says, he's going through this complaining stage, hitting rock bottom, his world's caving in around him, and he says these words, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. I've read that verse so many times, and I've never seen it in the context of what's happening. In the midst of his complaining, in the midst of him whining about, oh, God, there's seaweed on my head, and my ears hurt, and it smells. I'm in stomach acid. He says these words, when my life was fainting away, I remembered. Say remembered. Oh, come on, say remembered. How many of you have a good memory? How many of you can't remember if you have a good memory? I have a horrible memory. I can't remember names, numbers, and names. Can't, I, I struggle. I struggle re with remembering things. Jonah remembered something. Something so powerful. Something clicks. He's in the belly of the well. His world's caving in around him. The world's falling apart. His life seems hopeless. And yet he remembers something. I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. In that moment, we see an attitude change for Jonah. It's in, it's in this one verse, in verse, in verse chapter 7, I mean, in chapter, chapter 2, verse 7, we see a complete attitude change. Come on, have you ever been there where, where you look at somebody and you can see the light bulb go off? You know what I'm talking about? Where they look clueless? Come on, if you have kids, you know what I'm talking about. Or you're, you're married to a man, he looks clueless. And then all of a sudden, the light bulb goes off and they go, oh, I get it. I, I understand. We see a light bulb. If, if we could break apart the verse, we would see a literal light bulb going off in the belly of the well in, in verse 7. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you, into your holy temple. In that moment, he both accepted and respected his location. 
Write that down. He accepted and respected his location. In that moment, his attitude shifted from complaining, from whining, saying this isn't fair. Don't you hate it when kids pout? Oh, we never had kids that really pitched fits because I, pow. Not really, don't call CPS on me. I, I don't do well when kids start pouting. But you know what's worse than kids pouting? Adults. We all do it though. <laughs> I was doing it the other day. I told you my identity got stolen this past week. And I'm closing on uh, our home uh, next week. And I'm sitting here going, come on, God, I'm closing next week. Why, why did it? Oh, God, I pray you kill him. Now, y'all don't pray prayers like that. I'm just being honest. I'm pouting. I'm whining. But the funny thing is, is if we can ever get to this aha moment in verse 7 where our mindset changes and we can start accepting and respecting our location, there's a shift that takes place in our mind. See, sometimes it's real difficult to accept and respect where we are. Usually we do one or the other, but in reality, we need to do both. Usually we can accept it. You know what that looks like. Well, this is the hand I was dealt in life. I've accepted it. Woe is me. Woe is me. I'm sick. Woe is me, I'm broke. Woe is me, my family fell apart. Ah, it's life. But very rarely do we both accept and respect. See, respecting is seeing value in our position. And you may be here and go, well, Pastor, how do you see value in some of the circumstances that I've gone through? How do you see value in a husband abandoning a wife? How do you see value in a family that falls apart? How do you see value... And someone who loses all their retirement. How do you see value in people dying? How do you see value in death? How do you see value in sickness? How do you see value in that small child that has a, has a disease that they'll, outside of the miraculous move of God, they'll always be sick? How do you see value in that? See, there's a difference between accepting and respecting. See, in that moment, Jonah is in the belly of the well and he accepts, this is where I'm at. But then he remembers and respects the fact by saying, I remember the Lord and my prayers came to you in your holy temple. In that moment, he respected it. Click. He said, I'm here and yet you hear me. God, you got me alone to prove to me that you're bigger than me. God, you put me in this circumstance and the one thing you want me to learn, I see it now. I'm starting to get a clearer picture. The thing you wanted me to get is that my voice My prayer came to you in your holy temple. You had to get me away from everything that I knew was safe, everything that I knew was kosher and fair, and you had to get me into a place to where I've realized and I recognize that you still hear me. And you may be here going, well, well, why would God allow something so bad to happen? Why couldn't God just say, hey, Jonah, let's go play cards this weekend, and I want to tell you something, because in all truth, most of us don't learn lessons that way. If that was the case, our lives would be different. We'd hear good preaching, we'd allow it to change our lives for the rest of our lives, and we'd never have to learn lessons. But the reality is I could preach something a million times and we'd have to relearn it a million times. The reality is I can preach a message and then while I'm preaching it going, ow, that hurts, that hits me in between the eyes right now. We have to see value in our circumstances. No matter how dim, no matter how dark, no matter how depressing the moment may seem, there is value in the situation. In Jonah chapter 2, verses 8 through 9, I'm rounding third, coming home. Stay with me. It says, Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed. I will pay. I'm going to pay you what I owe you, God. It's amazing. He has this mind shift change in verse 7. And he realizes, okay, okay, God, I understand you want to teach me something. And, and, and I also want you to know, God, that I want to offer something back to you. I will repay what I have vowed. See, in verse 5, in verses 8 and 9, we see number 5. In his weakness, he found repentance. It's amazing once we realize the value of why we're in our circumstances. When we look at the, for value in the situations we're in, how many times it brings us to repentance. See, what God's ultimate goal is, is to find us broken. He wants us to be broken so that brokenness leads to wholeness. He wants us broken so he can make us whole. And I know, I know that may sound crazy. 
But let me, let me give you an analogy. Last night I was at, the, uh, at, at a uh, worship thing at one of the local churches. A lot of teenagers were there and other youth pastors. And this, this young kid gets up there and starts sharing this message. And he grabs a water bottle. And he says it so simple. He, he grabs this water bottle and he goes, God is like this water bottle. I'm like, okay, that's, that's deep, dude. Keep going. He goes, God's like orange juice. And he wants to pour himself into the water bottle, but the water bottle's full of water. And although a little bit of orange juice will get in there, it's still mainly water. He goes, what we have to do is we've got to get poured out, then he can pour in. And I go, hey, that's pretty deep. Such a simple analogy, but paints this picture of what God is looking for in our circumstances is ultimately brokenness. Because in our brokenness, he's made strong. In our brokenness, we become whole because he, he can fill up the mess. Listen, so nobody likes that part. I know this, this is not one of them exciting messages. The past two weeks, you may be going, hey, let's get through this Jonah series. Let's get back to something exciting. Hear me. God's taking us on a journey. Because before God can make us whole and use us, he's got to break us. He's got to break our willpower. And I'm not, hear me when I explain that. I mean like arrogance. I mean like our pride. For me, that, that mindset, oh, I can do it on my own. I, I'm the man. I'm the provider. I'm, I'm the, oh, that's who I am. I'm the husband. I'm the father. God's got to break me. You're nothing without me, Jeremy. I'm, I'm the pastor. I'm the leader. You're nothing without me, Jeremy. God's got to break me. And he not only has to break me, but he's got to break you. And he does that through circumstances. Let me explain something. When we're on the mountaintop, we're rejoicing. It's in the valley, in the dark moments, in the hard moments that God breaks us and shapes us and molds us. I know many of you in this room, I've heard your stories. You're lonely, you're bitter, you're angry. There's people in this room, you've lost jobs, you've lost spouses, you've lost retirement. You, there's people in this room that you're, you're, you're having a hard time finding a place to live, finding places to work. I understand it's in those moments, though, that God forms us and makes us who we're meant to be. We rejoice on the mountaintop, but we grow and we develop and we break in the valley. And God's ultimate goal is to break us so that we can see, in my opinion, what happens. It's the very last verse of this chapter. In Jonah chapter 2, verse 9b, it says this, Salvation belongs to the Lord. Can you say that with me? Salvation belongs to the Lord. Come on, say it again. Salvation belongs to the Lord. God takes Jonah through this hard place. And we see Jonah making this prayer and we learn so much about his mind, his attitude. But in the end, what we learn is the process that God's leading him through is ultimately... So that he will be reminded that salvation belongs to the Lord. Now that may not mean anything to you. You may be here and go, well, pastor, well, that's a no-brainer. He's a prophet of the Lord. Of course he knows that. Well, not exactly. See, it's believed that Jonah refused to go to Nineveh because he had this nationalistic view. Meaning he didn't care for anyone but the Jews. Meaning he didn't care about the Ninevites. See, the Ninevites were known as a very violent, godless nation. They were known as unclean. And Jonah didn't want them to get saved. I know that may mess with our theology because we go, well, who wouldn't want that? Well, we see it in the New Testament where the New Testament church struggled to get past this mentality that we've got to go to the Gentiles as much as the Jews. It's not a, it's not a, a place of life. It's not a racial thing. It's not a financial status. It's the word of God has to go to everybody. And we see it in the New Testament, but it's also happening in the Old Testament where Jonah goes, I don't care about the Ninevites. They can all burn in hell for all I care. That, that's what he was saying. I will not go and declare the goodness of the Lord. I will not go and declare repentance because, God, I know that you'll save them. And I don't want them to be saved. And you may sit here and go, well, who would say that? You do. When we don't go to our neighbor's. And when we don't go to the lady at the grocery store, we don't go to that young kid that's ringing us up, when we don't go to our mechanic, or our, we do it too. See, ultimately, the ultimate part of this story is not the well. It's Jonah's journey of brokenness so that he could ultimately find compassion. In his hopelessness, in his despair, 
in his world closing in around him. God had a mission. God had a purpose. And the purpose was that Jonah would find compassion. So when he declares that word, salvation belongs to the Lord, what he's saying is, fine, God, I get it. Salvation belongs to you. You want to save everybody. You want to save the Ninevites. You want to save the Jews. You want to save the black, the white, the red, yellow, and green, whatever color. You want to save the rich, the poor. You want to save, you want to save those that are in a high status of life, those in a low status. You want to save those in the good neighborhood, the bad neighborhood. God, I'm going through what I'm going through so that ultimately I can reach the unreached. God allows us to go through things to develop us personally, but that's not the end. Yes, we go through hard circumstances so that we can learn how to be better husbands and wives and mothers and fathers. So that we can be better workers. So that we can be better church members. We go through things so we can learn those. But ultimately, we go through those so that He can develop us in order to work through us. God allows us to go through things to develop us into vessels that He can work through. It's not always easy. It's not always enjoyable. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11 says, Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. These things happened to them as an example. We go through what we go through as an example. Many of you have heard parts of my story. I, I, I always try to share honestly where, what I've been through. There was a season in my life, many of you may not know this, but I went through six divorces. Now, I haven't been married six times, but I went through six divorces personally. That's a lot. Y'all with me? That's a lot of divorces. And I remember in a moment in my life, in a dark moment of depression, I was going through fighting suicidal thoughts. I felt this sense of darkness closing in around me. God... I don't know what a father-son relationship is supposed to look like. I've never had a normal, natural one. God, I don't know what what this relationship is supposed to all be about. You're you're described as God the Father, but most of the fathers I have known haven't been. There were some bad situations. God, I don't understand this. I don't understand why you'd allow me to go through this. God, if you love me, why don't you put me with a family that's together and happy? God took me through a series of Moments like Jonah had. And for me, it was a moment at a youth camp years ago. I had 60 young boys in a big cabin. And after a service, we were sitting there and I said, how many of you come from a broken home? And my leaders counted over 80% of those kids came from a home where the, there was brokenness. And in that moment, I realized God allowed me to go through what I went through. So that I could reach those that understood. And I understood their hurt. God allows you to go through what you've gone through. So that you can show compassion for others. God's a... You've gone through a hurting marriage. You've gone through an ugly divorce. You've gone through financial ruin. You've gone through financial rebuilding. You've gone through whatever it is that you've gone through. You've gone through it for a reason. And although it may not have been God's ultimate desire for your life. God will use those moments to develop you personally and for others see the 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 apex if you will of Jonah chapter 2's prayer is we get to look inside the journey of a man being broken but broken for a purpose you may be here today and go pastor I don't know what that purpose is it's not up up to me to tell you you may be hearing go, Pastor, it doesn't change the fact that right now it's a hard season and I feel alone. It's not up to me to comfort you. You may be here this morning and go, Pastor, I, I've been through that season, I've, I'm in that season, or I'm headed to that season. A season of being stuck in a place where the world seems to crumble around. And I just need God to teach me. I need God to show me why. And even if he doesn't show me why now, God, I just need God to take me on a journey so that I can be who he created me to be. I want to close by asking you a question. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm out of time.